Welcome everyone, I'm Patricia Shampton with the Texas X's and thank you for joining us for the August lunchtime lecture. But before we begin, I have a question for you. Are you a Longhorn business owner? The Texas X's is supporting alumni owned and operated businesses through our free Longhorn business listing and our new business membership. You can get great benefits, connections and tools to help your business thrive. And you can also network with alumni in your industry. Learn more and join us today at texasx.org slash LBN. And now on to today's lecture, which is called the Work From Home or Anywhere Revolution. Our speaker today is Dr. Chandra R. Bhatt, who is a pioneer when it comes to analyzing human choice behavior for transportation and urban policy design. He is a recipient of many awards and was listed in 2017 as one of the top 10 transportation thought leaders in academia by the Eno Foundation. His former students are now leaders in the travel modeling field, and many have received national awards for their research under Dr. Bott's guidance. Please welcome Dr. Chandra Bott. Thank you, Patricia, for that very kind introduction. Uh, pleased to be here and look forward to some of the discussions I hope I'll be able to generate. So uh, we will leave, I would say, about 20 minutes at least for q and A comments from all of you. Uh, so let me start off by uh, the title is The Work From Home or Anywhere Revolution. I do want to uh, credit my co-authors on this piece of work, um, Catherine Abusen, she's a PhD student right now with me, as is Aupal Mondal, and my colleague from Arizona State University, Dr. Ram Yala. So, as we go into this um, presentation, the real motivation is that we are at the cusp of some transformative changes in our transportation environment. Whether it be in the context of new types of mobility options, we have connected vehicles, we have uh, automated vehicles, and uh, in the near future, fully autonomous vehicles, where uh, there is no driver or the computer or the machine becomes the driver. Uh, but we also have uh, seen changes uh, in the past four or five years, even before the pandemic, uh, of e-commerce and e-commerce related business, where we uh, purchase our goods online, uh, at least occasionally, uh, or even purchase our food online and either have it delivered to the home or go and curb site. So you know, these are changes that have been happening over the past four or five years. And uh, it would be hard to argue that uh, the pandemic uh, has also changed a lot of our thought processes, our ways of uh, living our life, of doing things. Um, that's obviously been tragic in terms of the fatalities. Um, it also has changed our thinking process in many ways. And one of them, is our remote work. So before the pandemic, across the globe, the telework percentage on any given day was about 6%. And it grew across the globe to about 50 to 65% during the pandemic. And even within the 65, some sectors had close to complete lockdown, which did happen in the United States, uh, except for the most essential of essential workers, so that percentage went up to close to 90% for certain periods of time in the US and in many other parts of the world when uh, the peak of COVID was hitting that particular. So the question now that we need to ask is, we are still coming out of the pandemic. The pandemic might be with us for some time, um, perhaps as an endemic, but the experiences of working from home, has that changed how employees think and how employers feel about uh, having more flexible policies regarding remote work? So the question becomes, where will we work now? And it has deep implications, as I'll talk toward the end of the presentation, uh, not just for transportation, but for many, many uh, things So uh, before the pandemic, uh, the, the main two places of work tended to be home. 
uh, less so from home, obviously much more so from the office. Uh, but there are some pros and cons of each place of work. Uh, for the pros for home, I think for most people, maybe better work family life balance. Uh, it certainly saves commute time. Uh, and I say that for most people because interestingly, for some of us, uh, commute time is really valued. We are happy with our commute because it provides that transition from our workplace to our home place. So uh, some of us did enjoy our country, you know, being in our privacy, being you know, in our vehicles or any other place, listening to music, um, almost to the point where that is a time that no one can disturb, or at least you should not be texting and driving. So uh, I'm saying for most people though, it does save money. Uh, the cons obviously are uh, professional and social isolation, that is the worry that you're not showing up to management, you're not being as visible as you would like to be, and that might create carrier stagnation uh, possibilities. Uh, and also, you know, at home, you could have some distractions. Uh, the office, uh, the pros are the socialization opportunities, professional visibility, but all the cons that just talked about being pros. Um, and of course, the costly childcare and also investment in attire and clothing. And so on. Now, what uh, pandemic did was brought on a potential third work, which is somewhere closer to home, but not home. Uh, you have more of human interaction in these third workplaces. Uh, reduced commute is certainly a pro. Uh, of course, the cons are could be expensive to rent space. Uh, you could have, uh, once again, the issue of increased professional visibility. So the point is, each of these workplace locations has some pros and has some cons. Before the pandemic, the way that this workplace location was being thought of was it is a this or that. You either work from home or you either work from office on any given day. But what the pandemic has, through our experiences of remote work, has engendered this expansive possibility of working from different places at different uh, on different days of and kind of optimizing. Each one has pros and cons. So what's that optimal balance that you would like to have? Uh, maybe work um, 10 days from home, maybe work uh, eight days from the work office and work maybe four days from the third workplace. So the emphasis is away from uh, what used to be a binary of this or that uh, toward more of how do we spread our workplace location or how do we split our workplace across the period of say a month so that we are able to harness the full benefit of each one of these uh, environments. That is the focus of this uh, presentation. So for example, this might be uh, what, a, what a particular employee might do. A work from office, Monday, home Tuesday, office Wednesday, Thursday, uh, and Friday, maybe a third workplace. It, it all depends. And the idea of this presentation is we were wanting to know from employees in Texas what would be their ideal split across these uh, three workplace locations, including working all the way only from the office or working every day from the home. So that was also a possibility, but we we're focusing more on how would you split. Given you have 22 work days or how many of work days you work, tell us how you would. And that was based on many considerations that we go over demographics, the sector of work, um, and uh, where COVID is. We presented an experiment saying if COVID were at this state, um, or if your commute uh, to the third workplace was so much, would you choose? How would you split your uh, days? So, it had many different influencing factors that we could do. Fundamentally, then, we are looking at workplace location decision. This is the ideal workplace location as chosen by the respondent, assuming that the respondent has full freedom to do so. Now, interestingly, while we gave full freedom, it was also very clear that respondents were cognizant of the sector, for example, they were working in. So the so-called essential workers, they kind of, you'll see, they were much more toward uh, working from the workplace or the split was much more toward that while some others such as uh, those in public administration uh, those in uh, even education they had a little bit more of the hybridization or working remotely so uh, 
this was internalized. So we had asked them for their uh, ideal preferences. They internalized the fact that their job, you know, has some kind of requirement of being at certain places. So um, the what, so the who will talk about the demographics, the what, we looked at workplace geographic attributes and the workplace environmental attributes. So the geographic attributes, commute times, the location of the employment, the in-person workplace, et cetera. And in terms of environmental attributes, the internal environmental attributes, what's the distraction level at the workplace? What's the crowding level at the workplace? All of these things are brought in. So you can think of the geographic attributes as being external uh, uh, in the context of geography, and the environmental attributes as being internal to the workplace. So we looked at how these impact the workplace location. So bottom line, who are the ones who choose a specific way of workplace location and what are the factors that impact those workplace locations? We use uh, a pretty cool model that we developed here in uh, UT Austin about 15 years back, and that's got a lot of traction. Uh, it's a methodological way of uh, looking at uh, whether you partake in uh, these three at all or not, and if you do, how many days you partake in each of these three workplaces. So the survey was deployed in uh, February and March of uh, this year. Uh, it was the time that um, Omicron was perhaps just over its peak. Uh, I think Omicron peaked somewhere around January and uh, February and March, it had kind of uh, uh, slowed down some. Uh, it was a survey that was open across the entire state of Texas. And the way we recruited people was a mix of many, many different things that I won't be able to go over uh, this way. So we asked in the survey, demographic characteristics, employment characteristics, what do they feel about COVID uh, and their workplace? Uh, and also uh, for four different time periods, we asked what they actually did, but the focus here is on the right side, which is the stated preference experiment. SP stands for stated preference, which is what would you do in the future, right? And for the future, you are able to construct possible scenarios uh, based on commute times, based on flexibility, what, what the COVID risk once again very high or a similar COVID-like pandemic comes uh, into being, uh, distraction levels. So we were able to vary all of these things through our experiment to understand the effects of all of these. So this is an example question that a respondent received. So the first row shows COVID risk level. So 60% of people are vaccinated. The vaccine is effective for all current strands. Risk is low. In some other experiment, it might have been risk is high with specific values. And in this particular uh, experiment given to one particular person, all of these are varied across individuals, by the way. Uh, so the work from home has no distractions. The work from the workplace has high. And the work from a third workplace has got low. Commute time, we said, imagine the work from the workplace is 20 minutes, same commute as before. So we vary. These are the attribute levels. So it was either the same commute as before or 20 minutes more. Um, and similarly for the third workplace, it came up with commute uh, time. So essentially the idea was given this particular scenario, tell us, you told us that you work 22 days per month, this on the right side. For this particular scenario that you see on the left side, please distribute the number of days you would work in each workplace choice based uh, so that they all add up to 22. And you can put zero days as one or two of the, or one or two of the alternatives, as long as it all adds up to 22. So the total should add up to 22. And here, this person responded, for example, work from home 12 days, work from a third workplace 10 days. And this person had earlier indicated that uh, that person worked for 22 days. Now, a person might have worked only for 10 days a month. In that case, what would be shown here is the total would be 10. That person has to add up. Uh, the split. Okay, so the data description uh, quickly. Um, the sample is in burnt orange. Uh, you can see that color right. Um, Patricia, I hope that's close enough to burnt orange. These are intense uh, go long cons. Um, and Texas is uh, kind of in purple there. Um, 
So the sample, we had about 16% self-employed. In Texas, it's about 7%. So that's certainly an over-representation of those who are self-employed and an under-representation of those who are part-time employed as you can see the first pro panel slide. But when you look at the average number of days worked per month, sample in the Texas uh, averages, they corresponded very closely. And so was the average commute to your regular in-person workplace. Uh, so all of that in uh, very consistent. And before COVID, in the sample, 9.3% uh, said they work from home every day. The Texas uh, corresponding uh, value from the census is 5%. It's a little bit on the higher side for remote work. Um, and today, the sample is about 20%. Texas is about 22%. So in the large scheme of things, we were quite happy that uh, even though our uh, administration process was not necessarily representative, the uh, basic demographics and the work characteristics, they seem to come out to be not too different from what uh, is the state. Okay, so these are the results. Again, let me remind all of us, these are ideal work locations. So the first column says that 72% of individuals um, chose to work at least one day during the month from home. The second row in the first column says that value is about 68.7% for those who chose to work at least once from the work. So obviously those two values are quite high. Uh, and the third is the third workplace. Only about 15% said they work from a third workplace at least once during the course of their work period during the month. Now, the second column, the uh, second numeric column, shows the mean number of days across those individuals who said they work at least once from home. So 14.5 uh, is that mean, and workplace is also 14.5. So now you start seeing across individuals, kind of the hybridization. Um, and then about 7%, uh, you know, that is seven uh, days of what the average for those who work from the third workplace, given they had at least one instance of work from the third workplace. And the rest of the columns gives you more of the split. So you can see of the 72% who had at least one instance of working from home, 36.6% uh, said they worked only from home. These were the folks who work every day from home. So 36.6% of 72% work only from home. That's about 25%. Um, but you can see the hybridization coming up here. Uh, those who work at least once from home, 47.2% uh, of them work from both the home and work office. So that's a split you're starting to see. Uh, the numbers seem pretty similar for work from home and work from workplace across the board. Uh, but the point over here is that a good fraction of individuals have this hybridization pattern where they don't work only from the workplace or they don't work only from the home over the course of the time. That's the intent of this particular. So I'm not going to go over the models, estimates, the coefficients, et cetera, but what's the bottom line? That's what I'd like to focus on today. So the large scheme of things are the ones who like to work the most. Now, again, this is not a binary or a trinary of working from home or this. I'm just saying in the large scheme of things, who loads more toward remote home? Women, especially those who are single uh, and with a baby. That is absolute. So women with a baby, if they are single, they have a substantial preference to work. Almost exclusive preference. Interestingly, people who identify as being male, they are not impacted by whether that's a baby or not. Now, this speaks in some ways to uh, now societal norms that still seem to be at play, where the woman or the person who identifies as a woman, uh, you know, bears much of the responsibilities, childcare, and uh, for other households. Uh, people who are young. They like to be, uh, you know, they, 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 they load more the remote home uh, work side of things. Um, and now, this is not surprising. Uh, they are more savvy. Uh, and also, that, that is research 
in the psycholo psychological sphere, so to say, that young people, they have social networks well beyond their workplace. Uh, and so, you know, the workplace is not as attractive necessarily for these young individuals. Uh, those who are higher income, you know, this allows them more possibilities to work from home, either because of the kind of profession they are in, or because they feel a little bit more of out and influence about where to work. Urban or suburban dwellers, I'll come back to that later on, and people in white follow jobs. Uh, they are the ones who tend to be remote workers. Who's a commuter? That is, those who like to uh, go into work, men. Uh, uh, I only talked about why this might be so, the context of whether that is a child or not, uh, but men generally, it appears, uh, seem to prefer to go into the workplace more, uh, again, their social uh, socialization happens, or at least it seems like that's where much of men uh, obtain their socialization, while women tend to have much more expansive social networks well beyond co-workers. And by the way, these are all tendons, obviously, uh, exceptions to each one of these. So uh, I just want to be sure that I'm just talking about them. Same with older people. Older individuals, they have always been working from the workplace and um, Changing habits come, comes difficult for older individuals. But as soon as the rhythms uh, in some way get changed, there is a sense of loss of control, especially among older people, um, as perhaps their physical and mental faculties are especially fading. Uh, so they like to go back to the usual rhythms that they have been used to, which for most of these people uh, has been going to. Lower income. Uh, the rural dweller, uh, again, uh, that is literature that suggests that people who live in rural areas, uh, the uh, workplace tends to be the bonding, uh, the place where you come together, small community. Uh, and that could be one of the reasons, um, but also it could be because you don't have as much traffic uh, congestion in rural areas. And of course, essential work. Um, now, this is something that, you know, the term, the digital nomad, refers to individuals who work not from the home, not from the workplace, but from beachfronts or ski resorts or somewhere in Europe, as the middle picture seems to suggest. So we call them the digital nomad. Uh, they just take off, work from anywhere they can, and uh, mix fun and play uh, as, uh, in their schedule. So who are these? Third workplace workers. And now these are not necessarily always digital nomads. They could also be the individual who's going to uh, a hotel room close by home uh, to get some undistracted time close to their work. So interestingly, women with young child living with a partner, that these are the kinds of individuals who tend to uh, load a little bit more towards a third workplace relative to their. Uh, again, this could be, you know, knowing that as a partner and trying to get some undistracted time away from home. Individuals who are single who do this, clearly the correlation with digital nomads, uh, people who are young, part-time workers tend to do this more. Um, you know, they might not want to come in all the way uh, because of other obligations. That's why they chose to work part-time in the first place. So they tend to be third uh, uh, workplace uh, station and white collar workers. So, now we talk about the who, why commute time to the workplace has substantial impact on where people work. Obviously, longer commute, less likely to work from that workplace, from the in-person workplace location, or even if it's a long commute to a third workplace, uh, I'm gonna be less likely. Elevated for women, again, time poverty issues uh, are known to be related to uh, women more so than men. Uh, so that, that could be one reason. Uh, and there's disinclination toward working from the office if work office is located in a high density location. Again, maybe unreliable commutes, parking costs. Internally, distraction level, not surprising. Um, no distraction is preferred to a medium, preferred to a high. Uh, interestingly though, the uh, uh, difference between none and medium 
was much more so for women than for men. And that is something we are not sure why, but women are more sensitive to distractions than are men uh, in terms of their work. COVID risk, not surprising. Again, um, you know, immunocompromised, we tend to stay away from the workplace, and high COVID risk, the unknown, tends to make you work more. So, bottom line, what we are able to do is we are able to predict based on our modeling procedure, give us the gendered life cycle group, you now age, gender, the distribution of uh, children in the household, income level, job characteristic, uh, job sector, uh, and some of these geographic environmental attributes, commute time, etc. We are able to come up, our model is able to predict what would be the ideal splits of that individual across the three homeless. Here, they're just showing for three different individuals. Um, so one is a male, the second is a Female and a third is female with a child, uh, at least as uh, they identify themselves. And what you see here, here is really a translation of what I've been talking about from the standpoint of visuals. You'll see that men tend to work lesser from home. Uh, the single woman with a young child, absolute preference to work from home. And I'm just assuming all of these working for 22 days. I can vary this in many different ways, but you know I can come up with any combination you provide. Model will give me what the predicted idealized uh, fits would be. Uh, now I can uh, this occupation. So now I'm going only to toward the woman, uh, the person who identifies as a woman who is not single and does not have a young child, and not these are the occupation. And what you're able to see over here is. Um, public administration, that is the second row panel, uh, that has the highest uh, preference for working from home. Uh, rather, actually, it's the information finance, 15 from seven. Uh, so you can see again how the essential workers, healthcare, retail, etc., they tend to work much more in person, while the non essential, uh, you know, public administration, information finance, professional managerial, they tend to work more the most. So that's really the idea of this model. It can provide fits by any combination. So the last team of things for the ones who prefer generally workplace hybridization, work from different places on different days. Women have a higher split of work days from home than men. Uh, single mothers with very young child have the least hybridization. These are the ones who want to work only from home. Uh, and those 65 years of age or over, uh, have a high desire to work from the work office and low desire to work from home. So uh, these are some of the hybridization. What are the implications of this? The implications can be actually quite far reaching. Uh, for city and other regional entities, uh, maybe they should start thinking about uh, preparing for this desired mix of office and third workplace locations. Uh, that are uh, developers going to be uh, provided access to build specific uh, development. For home builders, uh, maybe you know, one way to um, increase their sales would be even much more of home remote work, maybe design homes with good soundproofing because we know distractions at the location of work can be um, you know, a put off for many people, uh, especially for business. Now, uh, childcare businesses may want to consider penetrating into traditionally residential areas. Why? Again, you know, uh, you could offer childcare services as you have much more remote work, same with nanny services within the home also. Uh, and for developers, uh, consider citing affordable hotels and coffee shops in areas with young, uh, with, with people with young children, uh, singles and low price housing, because we noticed that those with lower income, those who are single and those with young children tend to have this preference for third workplace So maybe hotels and coffee shops can uh, you know, look into that and locate themselves as well. So how should employers prepare for and design hybrid workplace models? Um, one of the big issues, uh, this is a focus on employee preferences. 
But I guess employers are becoming much more aware that they could also operate in a way that creates as little dissonance with their employees. Uh, otherwise, you have this great resignation that's sometimes referred to big quit. Uh, so how can employers rethink some of their policies? Um, and importantly, what our study suggests is employers should not view future WLPL arrangements as this or that proposition, that is working from home all days or working from the office all days, but really allow for hybridization of these patients because people want that. Okay? People are not saying that except for a few, especially those who are single moms uh, who like to work exclusively from the home, most of the individuals actually want to work from uh, uh, essentially this hybridization structure in their workplace. Okay, uh, how should employers prepare? Um, you know, one thing we found, which was quite interesting, is that the preference for workplace locations seem to be more driven by the distraction at the workplace, more so than the commute distraction. So people seem to be very sensitive to the amount of distraction at their workplace, amount of chatter that they hear in the passing uh, as they're sitting in their uh, you know, office. Uh, and of course, for employers, maybe this also is an opportunity through the hybridization to consider leasing smaller spaces. Um, and this is what I was trying to tell uh, earlier, the distraction within the workplace seemed to be much more of a big deal than even the commute time for individuals. And this might suggest, you know, allowing for these staggered work weeks uh, in such a way that the employer gets the full potential of employees uh, on any given day at the workplace uh, or uh, from the and designated workplace. Uh, one thing that our study alluded to, and it has been supported by some other studies, is it is not always good to have an open office. Open office space invites much more of distraction and you know the chatter. And so uh, based on our study and some other studies recently completed, it seems to suggest that having some kind of private space, not a completely open space, would be a nice way to go about doing it. From a travel demand perspective, this has got implications so much in the context of commute. You know, if we are going to have more remote work, we might have less commute. Maybe we don't have to worry that much about investment. But the other problem is if we do more remote work, we seem to be pursuing uh, travel at other times of the day. Uh, it's not like we just sit at home all the time. So you might go to shop during the midday. So some of those issues start coming into play uh, in the travel. So um, how to prepare when uh, COVID strikes again? The only thing we can think of in this context um, is really start thinking about partnering with uh, maybe hotels, uh, maybe coffee shops, and starting to provide third workplace locations to their employees, uh, maybe at a very subsidized cost, or even have some arrangements that is a win-win for a coffee shop and a hotel, for example, and for the employer. So that might be a good investment strategy moving forward for employers. So with that, let me stop. Uh, I did not go into the details of the statistical relationships and the uh, power of our uh, study findings, et cetera. But hopefully I have given you the bigger picture, the broader picture of why we believe this study can have implications across the board, the way we live, and not only for employees, but also for So with that, Patricia, I turn it over to you. Hi. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions coming in, so I'm just going to jump right in and I'll just ask them in the order that they came in. Uh, so the first one is, what do you feel is the impact of pre-pandemic assumptions on zoning rules and the obstacle those impose on your suggestions? For example, many suburban neighborhoods are explicitly zoned to prevent a small business like a daycare to be conveniently located. 
that's a very good point. I think we are living in a transformed world. Um, I actually feel uh, along those same lines, much of the transportation planning models that we had earlier had to be recalled in its entirety. Uh, and some of our transportation policies, and this is more related to a land use policy, uh, I think it behooves cities and agencies to rethink, uh, given our new experiences and now the platform way of life. Um, now, I, I think that's little doubt that the pandemic uh, has shifted our thought processes uh, in ways that could not have happened if not for the pandemic. Uh, obviously, the pandemic is tragic, but it has impacted our thought pattern. And um, at the end of the day, uh, I, I think for policy leaders and even politicians, uh, it comes down to what uh, the public Yeah, okay. Um, so this one is coming back to the gender question. Uh, with different ideal breakdowns for men and women, how can employers accommodate without furthering the gender gaps or perceptions in the workplace? Yeah. No, Patricia, that has been a question that come, that has come up many times. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an expert in uh, those employment-related issues, but I think the question is alluding to will some of these policies is implemented or how can we implement these policies that does not even further expand or increase the gender gap, the inequity based on gender, based on even race and ethnicity that might improve? I think that is the big question. Um, it would seem like as though based on these results, um, single mothers should be provided much more opportunity to work from home. Uh, but how does that play within the bigger equity considerations uh, of other people? You know, how does that start to come in? I think it's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. And I just don't have an answer. I think it has to be thought through carefully because anytime you focus on one particular segment, it could in some form impact the thought process of another sector. How do we bring all this together? That's a very complicated. But you agree that we need to think about these things. And yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, cool. Um, next question is, how can employers find the right mix for hybrid um, work of their, of their workplace? So what is the right mix of hybridization versus in office? Yeah, uh, again, wonderful question. Um, I think it has to do with the activity mix. So who is doing what uh, in the office? I think that becomes very important. Uh, so for example, in the health industry, uh, what tended to happen is that those in the back end of the health industry who are doing the accounting, who are doing the billing, you know, uh, even appointments, et cetera, they were the ones who started working much more remote because they could do that. While those who had to be in person, like doctors, though so you had telehealth uh, opportunities also, more of the actual in-person uh, kinds of experiences um, that had to be undertaken, those individuals came to the office. But I think that a careful uh, analysis, I would say, of the preferences within a particular employer based on all the demographic distraction levels that we're probably talking about, uh, but along with what kinds of activities you know, are being pursued at the office, maybe that's where the type of hybridization, it need not be full flexibility. That is, employees can choose any time they want uh, to, you know, uh, over the month. It could be that to bring in people who are required at specific times on specific dates. Uh, so you still create hybridization, but you also ensure that those individuals who it's most productive to have in person are able to do so on specific days. So it's kind of that mix so that you give employees what they want in terms of hybridization, but also kind of require them or a subset of them to come into the office every specific day. Yeah. And kind of a, a you know an additional question to that is. 
Um, you know, are there some incentives that workers could be offered to have a staggered schedule or a hybrid schedule? And the other piece of this is, you know, business travel meetings. So what are incentives for those too? Because, you know, that's dropped off quite a bit as well. So. Yeah. Um, I think the, 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 the second one, yeah, it has dropped off. Um, I will say this in academia though, it is picking up. Okay. Uh, you now we are traveling much more again, be in person. Um, and it might be a little bit different than non-academic businesses because our business travel tends to be for rather focused, uh, maybe once in three months or once in four months for a specific topic. And so we try to come together in person for that specific topic as opposed to be traveling every week, uh, which I know some businesses used to do. But I think that is going to be specific to each uh, sector, each employer, what is most productive. Uh, mm -hmm. And those are discussions that, um, again, I'm not an expert in, but has to be had uh, you know, between the employer and the employee, and also keeping in context the sector in which the employer is working. So this idea, you know, it, it's easily said, more difficult to be done, yeah. which is how do you marry employee preferences with employer needs? I think that is a huge question, uh, which I hope gets much more attention, and I'm sure will get much more attention today than about two or three years. Okay. Um, there's another question that's kind of touches on what you just said. Um, is there evidence that the experience working from home during the pandemic affected employees' interest in hybridization or was that interest always there and they didn't feel like they could ask for it or it just wasn't standard protocol? A good point, combination of both. Uh, the allowance to work remotely was very less before the pandemic. I don't have the percentages right off, but many employers didn't give that option to work from home before the pandemic. Uh, I think employ, employers are um, becoming a little bit more open-minded in that stance. Mm -hmm. uh, again, so that they reduce dissonance with their employees. Uh, it is a ret retainment tool to not you know, look at what employees prefer, you risk losing them. Yeah. So this great resignation. But the second part of it is also many employees who had the opportunity to telework didn't take it up before the pandemic. And for them, this was a good experience. They suddenly experienced, aha, okay. So if I'm working from home, I am actually saving so much time that I can pursue other activities. Uh, and so it's also this experience has created new awareness of this possibility. And so I think they are more open to hybridization these days. But you know, one interesting thing, not done by us, but my colleague in Australia, what he found is that when the question asked was, what do you do in the time you save by not going into work, <laughs> right? And what popped up as the number one was working more at home without pay. And then you start thinking, gosh, is this really helping the psyche of these employees? I mean, if they're working more from home without pay, is it actually increasing their quality of life? Uh, so no, this is a complex situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are many, many different extensions of what we have done here. What we did was a very focused, what do employees like to do in this new environment? Okay. Uh, given various factors uh, that we presented. So, but this is a large conversation uh, and I would actually, I, I feel like as for the audience over here, they have more an answers to some of these questions than I do because yeah. they're actually non-academic employers, at least many of them. And I wonder how they are making decisions in their uh, you know, employer places mm -hmm. uh, on some of these decisions. I'd love to hear and get some more feedback. I wonder, Patricia, if there's a way that they could respond to these questions. I'd like to hear. 
they probably could. Roxanne, could they just use the Q&A to answer that question if they wish? Yes, they okay. can. So yeah. if you guys have some experience or feedback that you want to offer, just put it in the QA and we'll, we'll publish it. So, okay. Um, while we're waiting for that, a um, couple more questions. In your sample, how big was the gap between um, people's preferred workplace arrangements and what they actually experienced? So was there a significant difference along the demographic factors? So I will say this. What people were doing in February and March of 2022 was quite different from what they preferred to do in a future scenario. Yeah. And I think part of this, though, is uh, still some of the restrictions. Uh, Omicron was kind of fading, but still there. Uh, and so, you know, this whole pandemic was like a forced experiment, right? So when you're talking about these kinds of forced experiments, if you will, not experiments, requirements had to be, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not free will. So uh, there was difference between yeah. what they were doing in February and March and what they would like to do in a future scenario to the point where, you know, in February and March, the percentage of people who are working from home was much higher than what they said they would like to do on their own free will into the future. Mm -hmm. So I think there's recognition that you now working from home all the days of the first month is not something that people like either. You know, they're really looking for hybridization. They seem to understand the pros and cons of working from different places on different days as opposed to all stacked up in one end or the other. Okay. Um, here's another little question about preferences. So did the study ask if employees preferred or were comfortable with, you know, swapping desks? So like hotel desks or desk sharing or flex spaces. Were they comfortable working and sharing those spaces with other employees? Yeah, uh, this paper and our experiments did not focus at that level of detail. Okay. Uh, but I think some of the references we have provided uh, discussing this issue of how employers can reduce distractions at the workplace, those references have tackled this. And at least one of those references has very clearly found that this concept of open areas is not the best uh, because it leads to you know, the sound permeation and chatter permeation uh, to individuals. And so having some kind of a relatively semi-private uh, and potentially with some soundproofing even over there, and it seems like it could help quite a bit. Um, we've got a couple of comments, kind of question comments coming in. Um, one is that I worked from uh, full time work from home as a consultant from March 20 to June 21. Um, this wouldn't, you know, this wouldn't have been allowed before. So it was definitely something new for, for this person. The clients were all having people work from home and then started returning to hybrid models. I have been working work from home um, full time remote since then to current. And it would be really interesting to see the data by job type and industry is what's happened. So is hybridization or work from home continuing or is it tapering off? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our studies do indicate uh, at a relatively disaggregate level of uh, industry sector. Uh, I showed about six different industry sectors earlier I think we had about eight or 10 different industries. Um, and the general conclusion, not surprising, uh, you know, I think that, that jumps out is that those who are essential workers, uh, they are the ones who tend to go more to the office. Uh, but within a sector, if you start having these heterogeneities in some people's preferences, some working would like to work from home, some others might not 
And that's where I think this combination of trying to listen to employees, but also try to pair things up in such a way that, uh, for example, this person uh, you know, might work from exclusively perhaps from home uh, as that person would like to, but maybe one or two days in the month, that person is asked or that person feels the need to come and meet up with clients uh, in that hybrid situation. So I think those are the kinds of discussions which I think need to be had carefully within each thing. Yeah. Um, I think we have maybe time for maybe three or four more questions real quick. Um, are the patterns you're describing or the research that you've done, um, is it mainly the Western world or is it international? Um, that is a good question. We have not looked too much at uh, the, I do know that some of my colleagues, and they're starting to look at inter-country variation. Mm -hmm. So my colleagues in Australia have done some similar work. I had a change with this colleague just yesterday. Uh, this person looked, uh, some of, uh, looked at some of the conclusions from this paper and immediately wrote to me saying, oh, we have done something similar. We should uh, exchange notes, et cetera. So we would like to go into that phase. Um, but in the large scheme of things, it does seem like Europe, for a variety of reasons, has not been has not as impacted by workplace location as, as the United States. So I do not believe that, you know, they didn't have, at least they didn't have these uh, protracted periods of, Kind of lockdown as we had in the United States, they were much more targeted and small periods of time. And so I think even during the peak of the pandemic, their uh, workplace locations are actually working from the in-person workplace, that percentage was much higher than what we had in the United States. Okay. Um, and then kind of a, a related question, then we'll move on to just one or two more. And uh, did the study look into a more open flexibility where folks would work from home for part of the day and then work from the office the other part of the day? So has that been studied? We have not undertaken that kind of study over here. And I think that's a nice thing to do uh, in this post-pandemic or at least uh, you know, after COVID onset. Uh, there have been few studies that have looked at that now, there have been some studies that have looked at that before the pandemic, but after COVID has set in, I don't believe there's been uh, much study on this. Okay. Good point. Um, and then is your research being requested and studied by the Austin transportation organizations like CAP Metro um, yes. or any county transportation yes. services? Okay. Yes and yes. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the Austin transportation department requested, uh, you know, some results from our study, and we had to tell them this being done. By the way, I don't know if I explicitly mentioned this. The study was funded by the Texas Department of Transportation, okay. and um, the final report is due within the next two or three days. And so we uh, indicated to many of these agencies, we cannot release the report until it obviously gets officially approved by the Texas Department of Transportation. Sure. But that should be within the next four. Okay. Um, last question. So, uh, academic fields make great use of the yearly conference um, to gather folks from, you know, geographically different locations in different fields, and they come together to socialize, exchange ideas, things like that. Is that something that employers should maybe consider when they're looking at a hybrid or a work from home model? I think it's a wonderful. And a wonderful idea. I do know that some uh, employers are doing that even before COVID, but far and few in between. Uh, I know this because I have been invited to some of these uh, kind of presentations, exchanges uh, hosted by uh, the employer. So, uh, you know, I, and of course, you know, if someone uh, pays me uh, to go to uh, of Madrid for three years, uh, about a year before the pandemic. Now, just to talk with 
they are uh, policy leaders who make decisions about investments uh, in the area of construction and in the area of transportation. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, you would jump at it, but I think more broadly speaking, some employers uh, have been doing that as part of an executive forum, if you will, of coming together maybe about once a year or so. I think it has a lot of benefits to it. Um, it brings uh, people, as I mentioned, from different parts of uh, the country and even the world together to start sharing some uh, uniform visions of where uh, the employer might want to go forward. So I, I think it's a wonderful idea to do that. Um, and I will say this, uh, we have started having many more of in-person conferences over the past six or seven months. Many of these conferences, we said we will not have it virtually. It just doesn't make sense to have it virtually because the full impact of this exchange, of this network, is if you're there in person. Otherwise, you just don't quite get it. Yeah. Wow. You have given us a lot to think about. And thank you so much, Dr. Bott, for joining us today. We really appreciate it and for taking the time to speak with all the Texas exes across the world. Um, it was such a pleasure to have you and learning more about your research and the evolution of future work. And thank you to everyone that participated in this month's um, event. We're excited to welcome everyone back to the Alumni Center next month for our September lunchtime lecture. Our in-person event will be held on Tuesday, September 13th with Dr. Roderick Hart, and he'll be diving into the question, political hope, is it still possible? And you can register now at texasexus.org slash lunchtime lectures. Y'all have a great week and we appreciate your time. Thank you.